Our last presenter will be uh, Tvoli O'Neill, who works at Saïs at Johns Hopkins University and we will talk about, will present paper on case extending the Eurasian Economic Integration Project, uh, regionalism and the multilateral trading system. I'm going to talk about the Eurasian Economic Union, or the Customs Union, which became the EU, uh, more from the standpoint of economics than from the standpoint of politics. Uh, I'm departing from the assumption, which I think was said by um, Marlene this morning, is that based on the experience of other regional economic or integration projects in the world, I think uh, the political dimension of them is, in some sense, dependent upon their economic uh, success, their success in actually generating uh, a mutual benefit for the participants. So I think it's important to come back to these questions and to look at them carefully. I'm also interested in, in the case of Kazakhstan, or for that matter, Russia as well, uh, but more focus on Kazakhstan, the uh, dual aspiration of Kazakhstan for global uh, integration, and integration, greater integration with the global system um, and with its interaction with the broader world economy and its regional um, obligations under, the, under this, uh, under this uh, union. So uh, as we have said, uh, people frequently bring up the notion that there is a, this might be implicitly a restoration of the USSR and there are a couple of reasons given why this isn't the case. I would add probably to me anyway the most obvious one is that there is, and I hope to show this with the data, is that there is absolutely no reason expectation under any sort of imaginable circumstances that the trade among these countries would ever come to predominate their international rela uh, uh, economic relationships. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it, it can't, can't be a restoration of the, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and also, the uh, foreign direct investment, as we'll show by the data, is, by no, is not monopolized uh, by uh, intra-group uh, uh, in investment. There's much more investment, much more broader investment. Kazakhstan, and that has not changed. There's no trend for that to change. Uh, also, we mentioned that the institutions of the of the Eurasian Economic Union are principally intergovernmental. It means that the heads of states, uh, each of them implicitly can veto the uh, any important decision. Uh, so, but there is some some uh, there is an aspect of supranationality, as we said in the Commission and in the European the, the Eurasian Court, which is as yet untried. The final important thing I want to point out, and uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, and I will show that from WTO uh, uh, information that supports this, that the, the common external tariff that was set on the, uh, uh, for the uh, Customs Union in 2010 is the same as the bound tariff undertakings that Russia gave in its, in its uh, WTO accession. So, um, so um, there should be, at least in principle, a complementarity between the uh, WTO uh, aspirations of the countries that are members and their, um, and their regional bloc. Okay, so if it isn't a restoration of the Soviet Union, then what is it? I would like to place it in the context of the um, uh, so-called uh, preferential trade areas as uh, understood, things like NAFTA, for example, as you know, or the direct, for that matter, these are data from the WTO Secretariat. And this shows, as you can see, a very rapid uptake, beginning in really in 1985, but accelerating after 1990, of the presence among WTO members <coughs> of membership in various regional trading arrangements. There may be a, a, a free trade area between two countries, or it can be a regional uh, arrangement. Sometimes they also are in extra regional. In other words, the U.S. and South Korea have a free trade area. That's that's here. Okay, so you see how quickly this has come to be an overwhelming global kind of development and phenomenon. And so what I'm basically saying is, why would we expect the Eurasian area to be the one part of the world where it would be a not part of the trend? So I'm saying that of course it's reasonable that we would think there would be some attempt to build a regional economic uh, block. And uh, subject to WTO rules. 
Now, under the WTO rules, a regional block, this is under GATT Article 24, a regional block, which is the quint you know, quintessential one, is the, Eurasian, the European Union, of course. The rule that applies to it is that the relationships among the trading, the members of such a group, can be, uh, have to say, more open than their relationship to non members. Right? So, so um, the block has to operate on the principle of so called WTO plus. In other words, what the opening is deeper than the opening that they have already undertaken in the international, uh, of, in, the, in, the, in the multilateral system. This is why the WTO remains important. I think, as a kind of a framework within which to look at this, uh, these kinds of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of, uh, of uh, arrangements. Because so long as global trade barriers are low, then these preferential arrangements have to be more open. It means the difference between them may not be all that significant, and therefore the distorting uh, possibilities of the block is reduced. Do you follow me? I can explain it. But in any case, so in 2010, the common uh, the common external tariff was applied among the three countries that were then members. And in 2011, as you know, Russia would be was on the in the process of uh, ceding to the uh, WTO at that time. There was an agreement in 2011 among the three countries that the first the one of them which first acceded to the WTO would apply its common external tariff. I mean, if whatever agreement that it made with WTO with respect to its tariff schedule would become the common external tariff. And that is what happens. So this is, these are data from the most recent trade profile for, for Russia and Kazakhstan. And you can see that the tariff levels applied on the, for all goods here, and then it breaks down between agricultural and non-agricultural. So you can see that the Russian and Kazakh tariffs are, uh, on average, are converging quite a bit toward uh, each other. And you can see, if you look at last year's, you can see that the trajectory of the Russian applied tariffs is to go lower, because it has to go, these are the levels that Russia committed to under its WTO section. And of course, so far, there's no commitment from Pakistan. But logically speaking, according to the agreement in 2011, they all they have to converge to this level. So the uh, Russian, there will be, I guess, a few exceptions, but in general, you should see them converging to this level. So, so Russia will have to come to a much lower level of protection on, as far as tariff protection is concerned, than it's at right now. And Kazakhstan would logically follow in that same, in that same direction. Okay, the composition of trade between Russia and Kazakhstan, I mean, not between Russia and Kazakhstan, but uh, comparing the two. This is their global trade composition. Well, it won't surprise any of you that their most important export, both of them, is fuels and mining products. And both of them are major importers of manufacturers. So we know that. So I would presume it'd be very, to me, un unlikely or hard to understand why Kazakhstan would import oil from, from uh, or gas from Russia or vice versa. So whatever trade they're going to have, it may be mainly concentrated in this uh, manufacturing area. And you see here that Russia, uh, the share of manufacturers in Russia's exports is higher slightly than that of Kazakhstan. So in my opinion, or my inference is, is that one of the reasons that uh, both countries, all three countries, might, and especially Kazakhstan and Russia, would be interested in this union, would be with a view toward diversifying exports away from fuel and, and uh, natural gas and so on, oil and gas, the mineral products toward manufacturers. So this, these data, this comes from the Eurasian Economic Commission. It's a recent report. It shows the composition of the trade of the members of the union, member states, which at that time were the three between 2010 and 2013. I want to call your attention to the red and to the blue. The red, the outer circles is the composition of their trade across the world, with each other and with the world as a whole. See that the share of mineral products in their exports to the world actually even rose from 2010 to 2013. But within the union, trade within the union, you can see that the share of, uh, of this kind of, of exports to each other actually fell 
while the, and most importantly, this is, this is manufactured from machinery, equipment, and vehicles. You can see it represents a much larger share of the intergroup trade than it does the global trade. And you can see that that is rising. So I assume, you know, that this is at least some sort of prima facie evidence that there is some kind of a, a success, if you like, gradual success in diversifying, at least among them, toward more uh, trading manufacturers, which I think is a policy goal of both Russia and uh, Kazakhstan. But it's very important to remember, as I think it's already been shown and was mentioned in the first presentation here on our panel, is that there's no tendency for trade among these three countries to become the most important of their exchanges. <coughs> if we look at Kazakhstan, exports, uh, this is a gosh. The share, the share of Kazakhstan's exports that go to Russia is 7% in 2013. It goes to the EU is 53.5%. It goes to China is 17.4%. So you can see the two of these way overbalanced any importance of Russia as an export market. Now, mind you, there are people in Kazakhstan I'm sure very unhappy with this and believe that it should be possible to benefit much more from access to the Russian market. And I, I think this is a source of grievance. But if you look here at the uh, role of, Kaz of uh, Kazakhstan market for Russia, well, Kazakhstan represents 3.3% of Russia's uh, exports by destination. Of course, their main market also is the European Union, and this is not dropping. It's if anything goes. So Kazakhstan represents 33 as far as the share of Russia's exports, but that translates into about a third, a little over a third of, of the uh, imports coming into Kazakhstan. So, so Definitely, Russia is benefiting from the Kazakh market, and uh, it's an important, uh, important market for, for Russia. And this brings us to the bilateral trade pattern that we see up until 2013. And by the way, I agree with everyone that the conditions of 2014 are so distinctively different and so dangerous for the project that I by no means want to suggest that we're on a trajectory that is going to guarantee success of the project at all. But when we look at this, a pattern of bilateral trade. The red is Russia's exports to Kazakhstan. This is Kazakh data, so it shows imports from Russia and exports to Russia. So you can see, even before the crisis of 2009 and before the enactment of the, the Union, or even the Customs Union, there was already a very big upswing in Russian exports to Kazakhstan. Some of this may be due to the fact that around 2005, I think, a CIS free trade area. Maybe this meant something because definitely you see a big upswing. And you see Kazakhstan's access to the Russian market on a pretty rapid trajectory of increase as well. Then both drop off. What's problematical is after the after the enact the creation of the Customs Union and, and so on, we see Russia resume its rapid uh, increase in its uh, import exports uh, to Kazakhstan. But Kazakhstan's uh, exports to Russia have not really uh, you know, after a couple of years of progress, it turned and fallen off. So that's mysterious, and it probably points to these non-tariff barriers, partly, which is very important. And of course, now everything is very much in question as we talk about the war. This is something that I'd like to point out, and I think it's very important and very neglected, and actually, Nate, Nate talked about a little bit, uh, in talking about the agreement, is services trade. Services trade, it's incredibly important in all advanced economies, such as the US, the EU, and so on, all the OECD economies. And it's sort of, a, in my opinion, a possibly unsung benefit of the Russian accession to the WTO has been in this field of services trade. As you see, the average growth in services trade on an annual basis in Russia, imports and exports combined, you know, uh, it's been you know, between 13% for exports and 16% annual growth for imports and services in this whole period. And of course, they acceded to the WTO in 2012. And certainly, the trend seems to be continuing. And I think this is very, very important, because as a, compared to their merchandise trade, you see there has been anemic in the last few years. But nevertheless, the services trade has continued to increase. So this is very important, because services uh, is a very complementary to like modernization of enterprises and the performance of enterprises because of accountancy, because of technology application, because of design and engineering and account, of, of finance and insurance, all these things and legal services, all this stuff tends to improve.
increase the overall efficiency of the, of the economy. So the trend in growth in services in Kazakhstan has also been strong. But I think that there's a possibility that the accession of Kazakhstan to the WTO will tend to require Kazakhstan to accept and pretty close to the same undertakings Russia made for its WTO accession, which was very, very comprehensive opening across a whole bunch of services sectors. So I think this could be a way in which the Eurasian Economic Union, because it tends to put Kazakhstan under a condition where it needs to adopt the same criteria, the same standards as Russia adopted, or better, they could probably do a little better if they wanted to. But this will be, this may be the way in which the Eurasian Union can be a sort of a means of importing the WTO in a positive way going into the into the Kazakh economy. Okay, now I'm going to do a kind of a hopefully not too absurd um, thought comparison because you know people often compare the Eura Eurasian Union to the European Union because it seems to be ostensibly very modeled on it in terms of the. Uh, in terms of the institutional shape and a whole lot of the rhetoric and so on and so forth, but in fact, I think maybe an interesting comparison might be drawn to the to NAFTA. And the reason why is obviously there are three countries, just like the three countries, important countries in the in the Eurasian sure. Union. And, all, and so what I did was I looked at I looked at the um, the GDP on a purchasing purchasing power parity basis in 2013. U.S., Russia, Mexico, Kazakhstan, GDP. And just on a very simple level of like just kind of back of the envelope sort of analysis, you can see that U.S. to Mexico now is not all that different as Kazakhstan as Russia is to Kazakhstan. So maybe there's a basis for at least looking at something like that. Because definitely NAFTA has the same basic asymmetry that this Eurasian Union has. And, but it's, <coughs> NAFTA is a free trade area. It is not a uh, trying to be a union in the sense that the uh, aspirational character of the um, of the Eurasian project, and it's not even a customs union. Customs union, of course, common external tariff. This is just a free trade area. But still, I think it's interesting and illustrative to just consider this one aspect. You could probably dig much deeper and find some other interesting things. But remember how we looked at the composition of Kazakhstan trade and Russia trade, and we found that they had such a huge share of their export mining and their imports and manufacturers. Well, when Mexico joined, the, when NAFTA was formed in 1994, I'm pretty sure that Mexico's economy would have looked pretty much like Kazakhstan in terms of that general composition, because we know that Mexico is also an energy exporter. But it's very interesting to see today that U.S. and Mexico, both of their main share of their exports is, is, is manufacturers and the main share of their imports and manufacturers. Now, how can that be? The reason is that Manufacturing increasingly in global trade is done at a level of what makes it called global global uh, supply chain. In other words, things are partially produced in one place and then completed in another place, and it's all motivated or driven by investment by multinational companies. In the case of Mexico, we know, for example, automotive is a very big thing. <coughs> so this is what's going on, and I would argue that the structural change that was worked by NAFTA on Mexico. It's just an example of how very important these regional blocks can be. Now, I don't say, and so I would anticipate if there were a persistence of a rule-based mutual opening, which would create grounds for investment and so on in the Eurasian Union, you wouldn't see something quite so dramatic as this. But there could be a basis for the countries who have joined it to kind of realize their home to move away from their strict, uh, from their narrow, uh, narrowly based. Uh, natural resource uh, uh, economy. So I think, and I think that's the, the takeaway here. Uh, so long, of course, is that the, that the WTO, the uh, global uh, obligations they've taken to market opening, broadly speaking, are not breached. So here I want to look at the issue of investment. So this is, this is data also from, these are data also from Pakistan, showing the uh, five billions of dollars, the investment into, direct foreign investment into Kazakhstan by year. And as you can see, Russia was way down the list as a source of investment in Kazakhstan in 2005, giving ministry much lower than any of the European countries and so on. By 2013, Russia had a more respectable position relative to the other sources of direct foreign investment. In fact, we had came ranked fifth. So 
if I sort of eyeballing these data, I don't really see, well, I guess the exception would be China. Apart from China, there's no other country that saw such an increase in their uh, in the direct investment in, in, uh, in uh, Kazakhstan. So I'm arguing that this may, in fact, have, be a manifestation of the significance of the uh, regional bloc, the Eurasian Union of the Kazakhstan. You can see the same over trend from a lower level, of course, from uh, Belarus. So, what do I want to say? In, I think I want to say that I think that the successful integration, uh, which is epitomized by the European Union, which is often counted as a, a benchmark for other such projects, I think that it's clear that it had to be built upon, it was built in the case of the European community, in a, a decades of mutual enjoyment of economic growth and growth and trade and so on. And now the Eurasian Economic Union is being confronted with a very serious uh, downturn in the principal motor of the whole uh, project. And I personally think that, especially since the institutions are so um, new and so untried, that this could actually be a fatal. So uh, I, I am not in a position to predict uh, any recovery either, but I'd just like to show based on this that there's more to it than meets the eye in terms of the economic dimension of it, at least over the last several years. So let's see. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you to the three of